Okay, so Ramon, first of all, apologies to you. Um, you were on time. I saw you there at 11 o'clock, and, and I want to say again how much I appreciate you being there and staying late for us uh, and talking to you. So I thought I'd have maybe start off with the three phases where you can give a little bio of, of, of yourself, a little background of yourself. Sure. And then I think some of the, the, the main challenges that the Tapilam nation is, is going through. And then after you do that, we'll, we'll kick it around a little bit and, and you can talk a little bit about what that connection is, some of the problems dealing with, with the people at the Alamo. Sure. Yeah, definitely. So my name is Ramon Juan Vasquez. Uh, I'm currently the executive director of the American Indians in Texas at the Spanish Colonial Missions. I also serve um, as a spokesperson for the Tepilam Coahuiteca Nation uh, when they need me to. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm, you know, the son of uh, Ramon Vasquez y Sanchez and Gloria Camarillo. Uh, we're all members of the Tepilam Coahuiteca Nation, and we've been um, engaged in this work and fight, if you will, uh, for close to 40 years now. Okay. 40 years. So what, what is your fight? So right now is, the, so the fight is, so our biggest fight right now is the protection and preservation of the Campos Santos of the missions of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, in 1967, the uh, mission San Juan Capistrano the archdiocese gave permission to the state of Texas to dig up our cemetery, okay? And so that's what kicked it all off. There, a hundred people were dug up, uh, and this were, these were Catholics, and for, our families fought for 30 years to get these remains back, and in 1999, we finally were successful, and um, the archdiocese returned 150 human remains back to us, and we had to put them back in the ground where they were taken from. That's not what we intended to start, you know, what we, we didn't plan to do that. But since then, we've had to repatriate, we've repatriated over 200, close to 200 of our um, ancestral remains back to the missions. Mm -hmm. So when we think it's over, there's another spade going, to, going into the ground, digging, you know, disturbing another cemetery. So in 2013, we, we reburied another 15 children that were uh, excavated at Mission San Juan. At, in 2017, another 12 were dug up from Santa Rosa Hospital downtown in San Antonio, which was also a, a Campo Santo, and everybody believed that those bodies had been removed and taken out, but they put a spade in the ground and they dug up, they, they hit bodies. Mm -hmm. So we've, we worked with the uh, Santa Rosa Hospital. We, we, we began to fight with them a little bit, but the nuns who um, were very gracious to hear our story um, stopped the project and regrouped and we were able to repatriate the 12 individuals with other descendant organizations right back where they were taken from. That's 2017. So, you know, I mean, here we are 2019, they dig up, at the Alamo they're digging up 11, 11 bodies. So our biggest issue right now is how in the heck can we stop these uh, cemeteries from being, how can we pre protect the cemeteries, how can we get them to, um, the laws of Texas to be applicable to them so that they can be around for a long time. You know, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's an awful feeling. Let me, let me give you an example. In New York City, you know, they find a, right in the middle of downtown, they find a slave cemetery, right in the middle of New York City. They, uh, they put a fence around it, and they preserve it as a slave cemetery. And across the street, they build a state-of-the-art uh, civil rights museum. Here we have the first Catholic cemetery in the state of Texas in the middle of downtown San Antonio. The first Catholics, the founding families of this city, and we have their, their burial places right there in the middle of San Antonio. We do everything to deny that it, it's there, and across the street, we'll build a state-of-the-art museum for the 1836 Battle of the Alamo. Mm -hmm. how, how, that just doesn't make any sense. No, and it's very interesting to me when I, I spoke to, you know, Raymond Hernandez, that the demands were not very heavy, um, that your organization yeah. was really willing to, to work with, with the Alamo, 
weren't trying to stop any mm -hmm. expansion or extension or, or rebuilding. Right. It was the preservation of, of these bodies and the respect for yeah. the bodies and the demand to, to give proper burials uh, to the, these individuals. Well, that's correct. And I think that that's why Mayor, Mayor Julian Castro, uh, when he formed this committee, the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee in 2014, appointed me to serve as his representative for that reason, mm -hmm. because he knew the how, how many years our families have been fighting for the protection of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And we all, we all felt like that was the, you know, we were in a good spot. Mm -hmm. From 2014 to 2017, there was no question that Teipilam Kuauitek Nation was not going to be uh, an important player and role on this project. There was no question about it. Um, we were totally engaged. Uh, we had the the project had our full support. We had submitted um, plans just in case there was human remains that were disturbed, so that we can um, take care of the, the situation, um, so that the project could continue, and it, and it wouldn't hinder the project. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt that. In the beginning, that we were uh, very, um, you know, we were allies on this project. Right. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that attracted me to the, your story uh, is when I, I saw a news uh, broadcast there, and uh, Raymond Hernandez had talked about the idea we want somebody to tell our story, mm -hmm. we want inclusion, we want to be part of, of the story. And, and immediately my ears just kind of pricked up and I said, oh my God, that's, yeah. that's kind of what, what, we, what we do. And, and so I reached out almost uh, immediately because I certainly wanted to tell, help, you know, or give an audience to for, for, for people to tell their, their story. And I find it very interesting because there's all these little catch words that, you know, a diversity and inclusion, systemic racism and all this. And it, it's interesting to me when I hear about something like the 1836 project that, you know, I, I, I think of the Alamo in 1836, but it, it kind of, uh, I get the kind of feeling here that what the idea is to really focus on white achievements in the Texas creation myth and negate all the other civilizations that had come before. That is, we're not going to talk about the, the first Texans, we're not going to talk about the indigenous people, we're not going to talk about the Tejanos, we, and, and with all the, the, the cultural um, you know, baggage uh, mm -hmm. the, the, that comes with that. Um, I was told yesterday um, that um, the, the concept of setting this up is a, a very much a political ploy to, to win the next election. So you throw this out. We're going to start with 1836. We're going to start with the Alamo. Uh, we're going to start with the creation. We're going to start with white superiority out here and, and, and the gate. And it's a very interesting thing that mostly when people talk to the, about the Alamo, they'll never go back to the mission in 1718. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they won't tell that story. Right. Um, Raymond also said something, which I, I guess I could figure out, but I didn't think it at the time. Raymond said, we were the first Catholics, mm -hmm. you know, so you're talking about the indigenous population and the Spanish mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. and, and, you know, people becoming or forced to become Catholic or, or Catholic. And well, n now they're, uh, you know, when they, when they pass and they're being buried, it, it causes all, all kinds of, you know, problems. Let me ask you, do you think that the purpose of the 1836 project is to focus on white achievements in the, in the creation myth? Well, I definitely think it's uh, it's about their story. It's not about our story, mm -hmm. because we've had to fight for since twenty seventeen to be included in this project moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From you know, our, the, the work that we've been doing over forty years, and I'm talking about Tepilam, right? Mm -hmm. The work that we've been doing as Tepilam and as a member of Tepilam is we've been reversing extinction that we've been pushing and pushing and pushing because nobody is going to tell our story mm -hmm. you know we've uh, we have to be the authors we have to be shaping what that story is going to be look be uh, looking like so you know it's all about reversing extinction we, you know we were written off as a people in the 60s in the 50s in the 30s by historians and scholars mm -hmm. We were, we were in, the, in the books, it says that we were extinct. 
And I've had to remind people that human beings, we don't, we don't go extinct. Mm -hmm. Animals and plants go extinct. We evolve. And that is our story. We are the greatest American story ever told, if it's ever told, about perseverance. Our people have been here for over 10,000 years in this city, greeted the Spaniards when they arrived, helped them build, build these missions. We became the first Catholics of this state. We became the first vaqueros of the state. We contributed to the American Revolution by, by, um, by driving 10,000 head of cattle to feed the people in New Orleans so that they could eat during the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. We were already uh, functioning as a, as a thriving Pueblo before George Washington was born. There are countless contributions, historical contributions that our people have made to this city, to this state, and to the country that have gone undocumented. Mm -hmm. And you would want to think that, well, you know, it was uh, an accident, it was not by design, but here we are in 2021 and we're still having to fight for a place at the table, for our history to be included in a physical space location that they're going to tell a story about unfortunate 13 days that took place in a hundred year history timeline and th and we have to uh, we have to push this hard to be included that for our story to be included in this narrative even uh, you know when when you erase a people's culture from a physical location that's cultural genocide. And that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. The power of the pen, that whole, uh, you know, to be able to just erase somebody out of history, that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. They want to, you know, when we hear things like, well, we're going to tell the whole story of the site. What they're not telling you is where. They're going to pick and people pick and choose where the interpretation is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because why? Well, we don't want to confuse anybody. We don't want to dilute the story. For example, let me give you an example. They want to, um, the chapel, what they refer to as a shrine, but the chapel itself, they want to program the chapel. What do you mean by program? Well, that's going to, you know, they want to have interpretation you know, programming in, this, in the chapel. They want to activate that site as part of their footprint because it's the only, um, it's one of two um, uh, artifacts that are left from the mission that are still standing. But if we stay true to, to this project being led by facts and evidence, then the only thing that happened inside that chapel was artillery shells were stored. And the women and children hid in there during the, eight, the Battle of 1836. But if you want to tell the, real, the, 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 the entire story, last rites were given in the chapel. People married within you know, the chapel. Mm -hmm. Children were given baptisms in the chapel maybe not within that structure but within that within that the church and then why do we know that is because we have the records and so i want to know is will you interpret our history alongside of miss dickinson's history in that chapel hmm. or I, the artillery shells uh, you're going there today and I took pictures of all the, the statues and, and all the, the people are there and you know, you, you can really see what you're talking about there. I guess they did have Juan Seguin, uh, you know, but... Uh, One of the elite Tejano family members. Right. You yeah. Know, who, who's included in there. So, um, you know, it just seems like a, a lot of hurdles. I want to ask you something else and, and I do think it, it is in some ways included. I, I told you the whole reason for my project and, and I, I did have to write this up for the Alamo, you know, to, to get um, 
the opportunity to get a permit. Why do you want to be here? You know, why, why you, you put this application? And I'm sure they have to be quite careful. Sure. But, but my, my argument was, was very much based on, uh, in part, Tapilam um, and, and Tejano history and, and uh, African-American slavery. It was this whole idea that somebody needs to tell the complete story. And along with that complete story is, is this whole I idea that if, for example, UNESCO is going to say, hey, we want to give you a World Heritage Site for the missions, plural, but for the missions, why in the hell are we, we going out there talking about 1836? Exactly. Why are we not taking it back to 1718? Why are we not talking about the indigenous population that we're actually building the, the mission and we're doing the work and what that relationship was like? And also that, you know, the, that conversion um, um, to, to Catholicism uh, is, is totally you know, left out of the story. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think a lot of this, I mean, I, I'd like to be wrong, I truly would, is when you hear about an inclusion, that the, the voices really start to be, uh, you know, part of, of what that, that story is. Right. And I think some of the, these things, for example, um, I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive, as we were talking about Professor Tiarina, where I was blown away by Tejano contributions yeah. to the Anglos. And the, what, what I mean by is that the Anglos taking, I mean, th this stuff is hammered into us. You know, when I think of American, it's about liberty and it's, a, it's about freedom. And then when you realize that so much were coming from the indigenous population, as you just right. pointed out, and the Tejanos, it kind of takes away a little of our, our, our glory, mm -hmm. that, that little crown. If you're talking about water rights, or you're talking about land rights, or you're custodians of, 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 of nature, yeah. if you know about freedom and liberty, and, and you did that prior to the, these individuals, it kind of it cuts away from the stories. And, and I suspect maybe by the promotion of telling you know, the story of the indigenous population or talking about Tejano, it takes a little glow off you know, some of the, uh, the achievements of other people. And then you know, just strictly as a historian, I would love to start my, my story perhaps in 1718 and say, hey, we're going to look at the Alamo, but not the Battle of the Alamo. Mm. We, we may want to look at relationships. Mm -hmm. I have, um, and then uh, I, I have a very good colleague of mine, his name is John Macias, and uh, uh, he, in addition to being a historian, He's a docent at the San Gabriel Mission. My, my brother, I don't know why my brother was married, uh, married, baptized there, but my brother was baptized there, not, not very far from me. And, and one of the things that, that he says is that when people come to the, you know, the mission, a little bit like coming to Alamo, you've got these beautiful gardens and, and you know, the birds are singing and it's really peaceful. I said, oh my God, you know, this is such a lovely, peaceful place. And it, it may not have been exactly like that when the indigenous population were, were building that. And what was interesting also in the, in the documentary, it was interesting, there was a, a, a woman who was a little bit older who said that the mission, the San Gabriel mission, oh my God, she just loved that place. She felt like she was at home. And her son, on the other hand, was totally outraged sure. by, by what, the, what the mission represented to, to the Tongva you know, people, the language sure. and the forced Catholicism mm -hmm. and, and other things. But, but, but that story needs to be told. Yeah, maybe, you know, if, if, we, if we were talking, and I agree because... We're talking about a site. And first of all, let me just correct you. Mm -hmm. There is no Alamo in 1718. And okay. that's one of the things that I got to keep reminding people is that there is no Alamo in 1718. There is no Alamo prior to 1804. Okay. So when you talk about the Alamo, and this is a mistake that a lot of people do, is they're locking it into a period in time, right? Okay. Prior to eight. Prior to the La Compañía de Alamo moving in here in the 1800s, mm -hmm. it was Mission San Antonio de Valero. That is its correct name under UNESCO. It's the uh, original uh, name. Right. San Antonio de Valero. Right? right. So Alamo just came much, much, the word Alamo came much, much later into the history. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, but I think that that's, you know, I really believe that if we don't start helping uh, or be inclusive of the entire story of this physical site, you know, then people are just dumber when they leave. 
Hmm? Our guests are just dumber when they leave. We missed an opportunity, you know, to, to showcase the richness of this city, hmm. of the confluence of cultures, right, mm -hmm. Th that shaped this state of Texas. You know, when there, you know, at the Alamo, at the, at the Alamo where we know now today is the Alamo, they, they talk about the Travis letters and they bring the Travis letters and things like that in. To talk about victory or death. Wine in the sand. You know, all that beautiful, you know, rhetoric. But there's another letter out there. There's another letter that Francisco Reese wrote, who was in exile because of the insurgency that he led at the Battle of Medina. Mm -hmm. And he wrote to his son-in-law, Blas Herrera, and told them, don't turn your back on the Texians. Fight with them. Have our men fight with them because only God will give, our, only God will give Texas back to us. You'll never see them. They've never brought that letter to the Alamo. If they did, maybe they could talk about how, 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 um, how race relations were handled back then. At one point in time, we had more white in-laws in this city than in the whole country of Mexico. Mm -hmm. We knew how to interact with each other. It was happening already. We were having children with each other. There was interracial marriages mm -hmm. happening. Angela um, Valenzuela, who I spoke of on critical race theory, and, and she had written a, a blog, and I'm paraphrasing, I, I can't quote it to you, but basically saying it was almost like we go out of our way to protect white kids that might be upset or commit suicide, yeah. we've been told, or be disturbed in classes, but we want to forget the whole story of what, what happened to indigenous populations and Tejano populations and all, all that the, these children had, had gone through. Mm -hmm. I have found, and I, I teach at the college level, that my, my students become more excited by history when they start getting the, the facts, when they get, sure. they don't go, oh my God, Mr. Haas, I, I feel shame for what my forefathers did 200 years ago. Um, they, they love it and it starts to come out, especially when, when, you, when you speak to them. I also have a feeling, and you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, uh, but uh, you know, one of the things I think of, what would inclusion do to people's psyche if all of a sudden the Alamo said, oh my God, we, we must include um, your culture, the letter that, you, that you're talking about, or oh my, we have the deepest respect for those that were buried, the indigenous population that were buried in the Alamo. We're going to do everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that they get proper or burials, or to talk about Tejano history, or to talk about women, or to talk about the institution of slavery, where someone would come out. And, I, and this is always an interesting thing, you know, it's like people pick, they parse out the information. You know, you, you hear about Texas mythology, well, we came here, we gave our lives, and we knew we were going to die, we gave our last breath to liberty and, and freedom. And then you say, but wasn't it the, the liberty and the freedom to keep the institution of slavery? And, and you hear in like the 1836 project or the repudiation of the 1619 project, we don't want to talk about racism. We don't want to talk about slavery. We don't want the inclusion of these cultures because that will well, clearly be addressed. Well, you look, you know, I mean, we don't have to talk about anything anymore. It's clearly in the actions now. Mm -hmm. We don't have to say a word. Nobody has to say a word. They don't have to say a word. It's in the actions. Let me, let me, let me just put this out to you. If David Crockett, William B. Travis, and James Bowie were thought to have been buried there and not burned, you don't think that we'd have an eternal flame burning all night long <laughs> at that site? Why... Are those why are the, would that be the case? And if that was a Catholic cemetery of Germans and Irish Catholics, do you think that it would not be protected? But the fact that there's nothing but Mexicans, African people with African heritage, and, uh, and, and American Indians buried there. They were less than human then, 
and even in their death, they are treated as less than human. They do not, what, what, what the state of Texas is saying, what the Alamo is saying, because there are no headstones that we can visually see that they don't deserve the, be, they don't deserve the protections afforded to them under the laws of Texas. Or the dignity. Or the dignity. Think about that. I mean, if that is our reality. You, I don't care how you shape it. If, you, if Davy Crockett was buried there, we wouldn't be having this conversation. They'd be protecting that cemetery, even if there were Indians there, mm -hmm. right? Or Mexicans buried there. But he's not buried there. And so that means that we don't even have to uh, follow the laws of Texas because we can't confuse people about the story of 1836. If you talk about a cemetery, then all of a sudden people are going to think, Oh my God! Yeah, it's a reverent cemetery. It's a, it's a reverent place where the Tejanos, where the Texians died and are buried. They'd be confused, and that's what we don't want to do. They don't want to confuse them. But look, the state of Texas just at the beginning of this year told the city of San Antonio and the Alamo Project, "You can't move that cenotaph. You can't move it at all." They went on a campaign. 29,000 signatures to tell them they couldn't move the cenotaph. Yet, they'll, they'll protect the cenotaph that has nobody buried underneath it. The only people that are buried underneath that cenotaph are dead Indians and Mexicans. Okay? And right next to it is a historical cemetery. Right adjacent is a historical cemetery of the first people, the founders of this city, the gatewayers to this state, the first Catholics of this country, of this state, is right there. Mm -hmm. And they won't do anything to protect it? It's about actions now. Their words don't mean nothing. Their actions are speaking very clear mm -hmm. on what's important on this story. What narrative needs to lead well, there's a couple things that, that hit me right now. I mean, um, I, I would like, you know, if you had your druthers and, and you could think about the, the future and what you would like in your, in your dream of dreams and, and, and your kind of world kind of moving, you know, forward on, in on the this, project, on the project um, and your work. Um, I am very interested in, in getting generally the, your story out. Sure, look. There are, so, the, this, this, so in San Antonio, we have five missions, five missions, all built within 30, 30 years of each other, right? All independent pueblos led by American Indian government structure. They all had their governors. They all had their mayors. So in San Antonio, they were all independent of each other. Each mission was independent. So at the San Antonio de Valero, we have governors that are buried there that should be recognized. We have Juan Rodriguez, the captain, the chief of the Rancheria Grande, a Yerbi Piamo Indian, who's buried there, who is noted in Texas history as being the, the, the chief that, that, that um, established a peace with the tribes here so that they could move into East Texas and San Antonio. He's buried there. Mm -hmm. So I would, he needs to be recognized for his contributions to this state. There should be a statue of him. There should be recognition of these governors that kept that peace and led those, uh, the San Antonio de Valero uh, militia to protect the Canary Islanders and the Presidio soldiers and the others that came in. We would recognize the 21 Tejanos from Mission Espada that mustered at Mission Espada. They went to go fight with James Bowie at the Battle of Concepcion and the, and the Siege of Bejar. We would recognize Damasio Jimenez, you know, other natives that came out of the missions that served and died with Losoya and Juan Seguin. We'll be recognizing their contributions and their history, not just as Tejanos, but their lineage as being, as coming direct descendants from these walls, being born in that mission. 
tying it all together, connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. There would be a marker with over a thousand names of the people with their tribal identity and their ethnicity uh, right next to it who are buried in the ground right there in front of them so that people can go see and read their names. Their names are like our names, Maldonado, Cantu, Perez, American Indians, African descent, uh, uh, Mexicans, Mestizos, Spanish, Canary Islanders that are buried there. Mm -hmm. That we have, it's all recorded. Well, I think that's so interesting where you, we were talking about perspectives before and you're talking about evidence sure. where all the evidence is there it's very hard to refute and you talked about the contradictions where you know under texas state law this is supposed to happen but it doesn't because it deals with 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 people who are indigenous and and, and that um give me another reason why i would love to i would love that there is a more logical and rational explanation other than that you said this before but i i just think I mean, the, the story would be so um, fruitful, it would be so exciting to, to see, for example, uh, again, talking about uh, achievements of the indigenous population or, or um, Tejanos, it, to me, and that's probably because my field in particular, but I just love how rich the story is. Um, you know, if we have, if Anglos are talking about liberty and freedom and water rights and, and land rights and they have barbacoa, um, you know, and, and we have Mustangs or, or, or something like that, that, that doesn't take anything away from me personally. I, I would, but this is a cultural exchange yeah. and, and, the, and, and an exchange can go, you know, both ways, but, but it just makes a, a more rich history than, than take, leaving that part out. Yeah, I mean, Bowie spoke Spanish. Mm. Moises Austin spoke Spanish. Stephen Austin, Austin spoke, spoke Spanish. Spanish. Right? Because they knew they were coexisting. Right. They were coexisting. You know, and, um, and you know, I think that, sure, greed, other things played into it, but there, there like I said, there is a, point in time where we had more white in-laws here than in the whole country of Mexico and I think that if we, that we could do, we could do a better uh, job of telling that story um, you know we have to think about the interpretation of this site and um, yeah I, I wonder and I, I, I said this to you earlier I wonder what the Mexican tourists what when they come to spend their money in San Antonio and come to visit the Alamo, what story they will hear mm -hmm. about Mexico? Will they hear about the invading army? Or will they have to um, stand under chance of remember the Alamo? I, I've had to tell some of the consultants, uh, they, they gave us a presentation and the title of the presentation was Remember the Alamo. And they went on to the interpretation in the presentation. And after the presentation, I was like, you know, you can't do that. You can't start, start this presentation with a battle cry. Remember the Alamo. 300 Mexican soldiers were slaughtered at San Jacinto after they surrendered under that battle cry. You cannot just use that. Mm -hmm. You can't use words like the invading army of Santa Ana. So you have to think about, you want to talk about perspective. That's a perspective, you know, even in the language. Well, something that, that I wrote about, I read the manifesto of Patrick Crucius about 20 times, only four pages, but I read it 20 times to grab little bits and, and pieces. And I also compared it with other alt-right manifestos of somebody in New Zealand or in San Diego, you know, plenty of places sure. you see what, what are the continuities, what are the similarities here? And it's like one of them was white replacement, uh, white, white genocide. But the position from the very beginning that Crucius talks about, I am not an instigator. 
All right, I'm not an, an invader. We are being invaded. And not only are we being in, invaded, these people are taking our culture away, it's our I identity away. Demographically, uh, Hispanics are gonna out outnumber. And it's almost like the, this last ditch effort, which you will see in all those manifestos. I don't wanna do this. This is a last resort that I am a defender, not the aggressor. Right. And I, I pointed this out that I, you know, Sam Houston uh, had, had said the, the same thing that we shouldn't apologize for taking the land, or, you know, away from uh, Mexico because they gave up on Anglo-Saxonism. So what he nicely did was to turn it around yeah. as as opposed to being the aggressor right. here. I'm the defender right. of Anglo-Saxonism, right. and and you Mexicans have forfeited that right because and 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 the way I see it, I mean, Cruces makes it. I am I'm a you know, I'm a defender. I'm, I'm not the instigator sure. here. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I listen to people talk, right? Especially in these meetings, right? Because I've been doing this for a long time. My father was a major historian of the Alamo. And, uh, and like I said, I'm the second generation working on trying to preserve something that the state or the city have the obligation, had the obligation to preserve it. We don't own the property, right? Mm -hmm. The cemetery, they should have done this already. You know, but, um, you know, it's just, uh, I hear people talk and it's like, you know, why didn't they kill Santana? Why didn't they kill Santana at Goliad? I mean, at, at San Jacinto. Why did he go on to serve and fight the United States again? Mm -hmm. Why did he travel to Mexico? Why did he die an old man? If he was such a tyrant, mm -hmm. I think he was re elected, you know, by his country. Mm -hmm. What does Mexico teach about the Alamo? I think we got it so wrong here. You know, in San Antonio, right next to the Alamo, there's a big red ribbon on the street. It's a statue. It's huge, right? Mexico gave that to us. It's called the, the, the ribbon of, I think it's called the torch of friendship. And Mexico gave that to us. In some of the public comments that we were having, uh, as the, our committee was having, with the, one of the public comments was, move that, that, that damn red ribbon away from the Alamo. That's the sentiment here, man. Mm. That's how we can protect a senator, an empty tomb to, a fall, to fallen men and turn our backs on the final resting place of the first Catholics of over a thousand Catholics on the same side. We can do that at the same time. Yeah. And that's what we're doing here. We're talking uh, two sides of our mouth. Right. The other day, we at one of our meetings... Uh, the, there was, uh, if you look on YouTube, you can see our last meeting, I think it was October 5th, and you'll see our interactions on, on there. And um, one of our tri-chairs says, I've spent an hour and a half here in this meeting, listening to what the interpretation plan was going to look like, and not one mention of any black person or, or slavery in an hour and a half presentation that you just gave us. And one of the consultants says, well, you know, we're going to we're going to be inclusive of this, you know, and what we know, we want people who have direct lineage, you know, we want to incorporate them into the interpretation. And, you know, we'd love to have them there telling their stories. And I'm sitting there going, really, you want our people to be docents. They're good enough to be docents for this project, but they're not good enough to be part of the, uh, the, the research team. You want us to talk about you know, you, you, reenactors, docents? A little crumb here. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's how dumb that was, right? I mean, I was like, really? That's mm -hmm. just dumb. I wonder, though, you know, getting back to what we talked about is dehumanization uh, yeah. and in so many places. Um, you know, it, it's like that, you know, I, I don't know what justification anybody could make for not, right. you know, giving up the, the bodies for a proper burial or respecting uh, people who right. have passed away or, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, I don't comprehend it. It's incomprehensible, you know, to me. It'd be, you know, John, it'd be different if we didn't know 
that they existed. Mm. It'd be different if we didn't have any records and we just thought they were here. Mm. It'd be different, but it's not. It's you not the that evidence. Case. It's there, yeah. right? And um, you know, it's just it's a it's a shame that in, with all everything that's going on in this country, you know, the um, you know the the issue of of um, you know the issue of race, you know, and inclusion, um, you know, that we would we would take this opportunity as the seventh largest city in the country and lead with one of the most with, with the largest symbol of freedom and liberty, where we could break these chains for ourselves and the rest of this country and lead. Right? That we we do the opposite. We dig in. We dig in. You know. In, 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 and promote the myths and the stories that we want to tell, not the entire truths. We pick and choose what evidence we want to use. Mm. And that's our struggle right now. That's my struggle with the Alamo. It's like you're picking and choosing your evidence. Mm -hmm. Well, it also seems to me, it's like if we want to follow those particular words of inclusion and diversity and, and you know, if we're attacking or getting after systemic racism, it's almost like something's laid, as you say, almost on a silver platter. I mean, what would it be like if, if Tapilam Nation or indigenous populations were included in the story, or if Tejanos were included in the story, mm -hmm. or, or maybe, you know, we weren't telling, or someone could go out there and, and really look at the, the institution of, of, of slavery and, and why individuals. I mean, it's interesting to me, and, and you showed the collaboration, you gave me good examples if you're talking about, you know, Stephen Austin assimilating, learning how to speak Spanish, being part, or, or you know, that, that's a, a great um, example of respect, taking the time to learn. I mean, it, sure, it can be very pragmatic and yeah. making money in business and, and working with people, but also, you, you find around the world, anybody who tries, tries to speak somebody else's language, there, there, there's a little bit of respect there. But to me, the healing process would just be unreal. Yeah. If you looked at, so first of all, you know, Stephen, why didn't Stephen Austin die at the Alamo? Hmm. He wasn't there. He, he was just as vested into this homeland mm -hmm. as any other, anybody else. Mm -hmm. He was there. But, you know, I mean... Um, let me ask you this. Yeah. There, there's a couple things. Um, you can, can we collaborate with you? Do you see a way of collaborating? When you say we... Well, your organization, my, me, my... I mean, if, if someone throws out to me, I would have tell you just really quickly, Lulac threw out, and this was very interesting because I was paying attention. He says, can anybody give us a, a, a proper story of what happened at the Alamo? Mm -hmm. Within two minutes, I answered them. Okay, um, then, then they asked uh, some other kind of question. I said, hey, you know, someone asked for help and, and I'm saying I could help you. I don't mean I'm the one person yeah. that's going to solve everybody's problem. Yeah. But, but I told them that in lieu, like I was going to the Alamo. So t today, um, I, I think you helped me in that. If I take this video and go back and said, what we were looking at is, is a you know, going for a proper truth, an inclusive of truth, a story about how many indigenous people are, mm -hmm. are, are buried, the achievements of indigenous population that we, we don't know. Of course, I've got a lot on the, you know, six Tejano historians. Shit. But my, my point is, is that, you know, when, when Raymond first talked, he said, no, nobody's telling our story. Yeah. So if we need, if you're asking me, can we collaborate? Can we get your assistance? Can we, can we help you help us by telling our story and making sure that we definitely, there's no question about it. Can I go get something real quick? Um, can we, can we fit? I was just going to say, I was just well, gonna show you something in regards to yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, do this real quick. Let me just, um, let me check your report to make sure you're wrong. So, where is it? This right here. So, we've been. So when we talk about collaboration and inclusion, you know, about telling our story, this is 1939. This is my grandmother, right, with my father inside her belly. And she's with the, she, they start the Native American Voters League. Do you, can you want to lift it yeah. up for us just so? The Native American Voters League. And the reason they started the Native American Voters League was because they were not being included in the, as, as Aboriginal people 
they were not being included in the fiesta patrias that the city of San Antonio and the Mexican consulate were planning for San Antonio. Because our people were not from lands far away in Mexico. We could not participate in the planning of these events or as, as Aboriginal people. So they started the Native American Voters League to fight for inclusion and to have our stories be told. They didn't win, but this is how long you know, our, our stories have been, our, our people have been working towards inclusion, right? And we're not, and, uh, the church isn't helping us. You know, we'd like for them to be better partners with us. I mean, the stewards of our heritage. You got to remember something, man. We've been shamed out of our heritage and culture time and time and time again. We've been shamed out of our culture by the Spanish, by the church, by the Texians, by the Americans, Right by the Mexicans, we've been shamed out of our culture time and time and time again. The Alamo is shaming us out of our culture because we're not fairly recognized Indians. And and give us a little detail on uh, on that for the uninitiated. What what, what does that mean that you're not recognized? So so basically, you know, there's two there's two standards of American Indians in the United States. There's fairly recognized that have been become wards of the, of the federal government, mm -hmm. right? They're the ones that have reservations and things like that that we all know about across the country. And then there's about, and there, there's thousands, a couple thousand of non-federally recognized American Indian tribes, right. right? They've been recognized by the states or in some other faction, but not by the federal government. Okay. okay. And that's the difference because we're not federally recognized. They're saying that they don't have to work with us. Mm-hmm. Right, even though we're lineal, that we represent lineal descendants of people who are actually buried there, like Raymond's grandma and grandpa's aunties and uncles and cousins are buried there, mm -hmm. and many others that we represent. You know that that that's not good enough. And the other thing too is we try to tell people it's like, look, this is not. You know, we have a different history, and so uh, than other American Indians across this country. You know, we. Our, um, we have Spanish last names, you know, we, um, we were the first Catholics, we were our people were buried there, um, you know, that, this is a Catholic, it's not an old Indian burial ground, it's not like a, an Indian burial ground that was found someplace in West Texas, this was an intentional cemetery that was consecrated by the, by the archdiocese for the burial, for the, the burial pra um, rites of Catholics. Mm -hmm. All non-Catholics were buried outside the walls of San Antonio de Valero, the mission. And that's clear. That was, that was the practice. So everybody buried there were Catholics. All non-Catholics were not buried there. They were buried outside the walls. You know, we were talking about the, the dehumanizing of a site. It's, you know, I have to remind people, and I've done this, you know, several times to my committee, to the committee that, I, that I'm on, is... We have to remind people that these, that, that these were human beings, that people fell in love here. It was not just a battle. There wasn't 189 men just fighting, you know, so many women hiding. You know, this was, you know, a, a, a community at one point. You know, to, to not even talk about the, I mean, people fell in love, children skinned their knees just like kids do today. You know, mixing people, of cultures and yeah, I mean, one of the uh, one of our um, one of our city council persons is a direct descendant of Toribio Lozoya. I mean, yeah, I mean it's like our our history is like is woven interwoven throughout this history the history of San Antonio. But if you if you think about the if you listen to the story of San Antonio being told by the state or San Antonian, you would think that when the Spanish got here, they were greeted by mariachis. You know? <laughs> yeah, 10,000 years of history. Right. Of recorded history. Um, you know, it's just... Uh, so we would definitely cooperate. I mean, um, we ha there's, there's a lot to tell. We're, we're writing a book uh, on the Tepilam Coahuatec Nation, and then we also are producing... Uh, uh, the new translation of the burial records for for Valero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've it's it's about five about five hundred pages, 
you know, it's huge. Uh, we'll be putting it out within the next couple of months. Um, and it's all re the, uh, all the, all the burials, um, redone mm. for Vanero. Um, it's just, a it's, uh, this, this, this fight, um, over the cemetery has to end. It can't go on for another generation. You know, if, um, uh, if we've, we have more educated people in the history of the world right now. And they say that history is uh, judged by the moral of the time, or the morale of the time. And I wonder and I fear how our children will judge us based on the morale of our time. Hmm that we know so many untruths, that we have so many, we've produced so many educated, intelligent people, and we can't change the narrative for the future generations. They're either going to be proud of us or they're going to hate us. But that's the, uh, that's the reality that's going on right now. It's not about Phil Collins. It's not about that cenotaph. You know, it's about the rest of the world looking down on Texas. And in Texas, the rest of the world looks brown. The future of that world looks brown. Mm -hmm. The Latino population, the, you know, the brown population in this state is booming. It's booming across the country. So whatever interpretation plan is being developed right now, I hope they're taking that into consideration for the future generations. If not, they're going to have another battle. Mm -hmm. and it'll be a waste of a half a billion dollars of taxpayer money yeah what what do you think uh are you an optimistic person like you know what what do you think the prospects are moving moving ahead you know i think that the leadership there is now mm -hmm. today with us with the executive director today i think she's in a bet and in uh she's definitely um trying mm -hmm. okay uh, but it's, you know, there's no question that it's the complexity of this project is, but, you know, it's the Alamo. You have to know that it's the Alamo. You, you know that coming on. Taking the job, you know that. If you didn't know that, then maybe... You, know, you didn't do your homework <laughs> yeah. or, you know, what's going yeah. on, you know. Yeah, but, you know, you would know that it's the Alamo. It's going to be, it's going to be heated. It's going to be tough. Sure. You know, and um, so I, I don't know, you know, I... I, I it was very promising in the early days. One of the, when we established the, um, the guiding principles for this project in 2014, one of those guiding principles is that there was issue of healing, right? That it would be a place of healing. And I still believe that this, you know, if we were to treat this place as a site of conscious and call it what it is, because that's what it was, then I think that we would have a better opportunity to, sp to tell those stories. Very similar to uh, the 9-11. Mm -hmm. You know, it, again, I don't feel, you know, conflicted or I, I, don't, I don't feel like, oh, well, I mean, I, I see this in such a positive uh, of a light, um, you know, the, the inclusiveness um, I, what's very interesting to me, uh, you, you saw Bruce today or, uh, you, you work with Bruce Winders and anything there is, is there, um, is, is there like a, a conflict? You know, one of the things that I have to, to share with you and I, and I, I think I, I learned, um, you know, a, a lesson, um, which I, I'm not aware of. Don't use my name. No, 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 that's not, that's, no, 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 that, that's that. Oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, no. <laughs> but, but, you know, when, when I set up kind of like groups, you know, one of the things I, I really like doing, I do, you know, I have to tell you the, the, the most difficult thing you'll ever do is get an Israeli and Palestinian together sure. to try to enlighten your student. Sure. It's a disaster every effing sure. time. I mean, it, it just is. Yeah. You go out of the way, I have like two rabbis, two Palestinians, like, you know, you're trying to get that equity and, and you're just like doing it and, and you know it's going to be a shit show. Yeah. And it always happens. So the, one of the things I didn't know is, um, well, I, I have, there's a professor who knows about the lower Rio Grande Valley and racism against uh, Mexicans. And I, I just heard him on a podcast. I've only recently met him. And, you know, um, I kind of invited him out. And 
you know, a lot of people don't want conflict in any kind of discussion. You know, they've said, yeah, I'll give you an hour of my time for an interview. Is it Omar? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And it, it's like um, the, this kind of, you know, the things that I'm not aware of, whether what I've picked up, and I didn't even name names, like, I don't know if we would call it backstabbing or bitchiness or, you know, not, don't have that guest on. And it, what I find is very polarized, where I, where I think I'm trying to be inclusive and bring a couple of guests. I, I don't. I mean, you can have different ideas. You know what I mean? The, I like that. I like someone to challenge. Like for example, you know, one of my guests, I'm not name it, but I was talking about you know Anglo racism against Latinos, and and I was you know kind of correct. Well, you know, racism is global, and I said, well, you know, I know it's global, but my my focus, like we have to focus on something. You know, we can't solve every. My focus here is that I, I'm looking on, on on racism, and then you'll have somebody else. For example, I I spoke with Martha Menchaca. Um, oh my, you know, really great presentation, and I asked her. I said, my work is now looking at you know race and and racism and the racialization of you know latinos am, am i on fertile ground am i on solid ground for her it's, it's like a slam dunk sure. you're, you're absolutely right then you talk to somebody else and and another thing that i i fell in you know sometimes you think that people are are part of a like a monolith like when you're talking about tejanos they're kind of all similar or something you realize their experiences and their drives and what they want and the relationships are you know all very different but to me, I didn't realize how politicized, you know, when people, one person doing something on the Alamo, one person one person doesn't want to talk to this person, um, you know, <laughs> somebody else with their, um, you know, so. It, well, that's what, I mean, so right now the county is trying to put me on their Alamo committee, museum committee, mm -hmm. right, for the county. They're getting pushback. The Alamo's telling them, no, we, we don't want Ramon on the committee as mm -hmm. your representative. Mm -hmm. But this, the Alamo, I mean, the, the county, they have tried to get me on there. But Omar's on there, you know, on the committee. There's a few people on that committee. And, uh, and at this last presentation, I had to tell Bruce, I don't have anything against Bruce. I've known Bruce for a long time. We've never really worked together, but, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, um, he's got his perspective. You know? Right, yeah. And, uh, but... You know, I, I had to tell him and the other panelists was that just because you have certain people on this list, you know, as consultants, doesn't mean they speak for us. You know, that's a, you know, that's a reality, too. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are just so disconnected, especially scholars. You know, scholars, you know, the, most some, you know, they, they have to write and just write and write and write. You know, they don't have to connect dots. And I think that, that's, that this project, this project has to have a human element that connects the dots. Because then it's just a relic of the past. And what we're saying, and what our fight about the cemetery is not, is not a relic of the past, is that there are lineal descendants who are still living and contributing to this city who are tied directly to these people who are buried here. And our work is, is about connecting the dots because we, you can't, um, I hate this word, compartmentalize mm -hmm. history like this mm -hmm. in San Antonio. That was a lesson I got to today too, you know, you, you can't do that, the, the, the connections with all that. I, you know, <clears throat> along this line, and I think we'll just, you know, we'll wind it up here. I, I've been plaguing, you know, my, myself, you know, I, and I, I'm straightforward. Sometimes when I'm doing this, I get quite depressed. <laughs> no, I, I mean, my, this vid, you know, okay. this, you know, you know, and, and then the, the next day I get an interview like yours and I get really kind of high and, and, and because I think that there's something really, really there that, you know, I think when you get to a point, it's almost usable stuff that, you know, if I do something and 29 people look at it, it's not because the you know uh, ego or I, I need all the view. I mean I, I interviewed Roger Waters of Pink Floyd. I think there's fifty seven you know thousand people that have looked at it. It's not two million. It's not like twenty five sure. million or something. But for me, it, it's the impact. Like I would love for people to know your story or share your story yeah. or share 
you know, the trials and tribulations that you're going through. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, as, as an outsider, but an ally, I mean, I think it would be so fantastic if, if one day yeah. they said, oh, my God, this is a real inclusive Alamo. Yeah. We've got all your oh, stories. Sure. Yeah, I, I, so I don't know how many people have done this. I know that there is some in the United States. But two years ago, I had to, I had to travel to UC Davis mm -hmm. to pick up 26 human remains that had been taken from our mission at San Juan in the, in the 60s. They found them in a closet. Okay, I had to go pick them up and bring them home. There were pieces of them, and we had to reunite them with the rest of the bodies that were in storage here. The Alamo has another 11 bodies that they're keeping stored. I don't know whose grandparents those are. Mm. You know, I don't know how they're being treated. We were, we were uh, for 25 years, because I don't, so, so this right here, yeah. We, we um, after that happened, we had a forgiveness ceremony and we, we continued to do this ceremony every year for 25 years. Up until 2018. In 2018, they, sh they um, so every year for 25 years, the, there would be two guards, they would open the door, they'd be all smiley rangers, you know, at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, they'd be there. They'd open the doors for us. We'd go inside there, and we'd have our ceremony, our yanto, right? Our, our reading of the names, right? It's a wailing ceremony of the dead. And for 25 years, we did that. We, our children grew up doing this. And our, in our belief system is that we're so connected to our dead that we believe that we take vows to protect these sites, uh, especially since they've been dug up, that they will, that we'll, we, we vow and commit ourselves to never allow that to happen again, right? And we believe that our lives will be turned around. In Spanish, we call that chisqueado, that, we, that our life would be turned around, the, the, the opposite would happen to us if we didn't fulfill our vows. So in 2018, we show up. We're, we're, already, we're already pushing the cemetery issue. We're not going to bargain with the dead. Right? We want them protected. We want an archival investigation done. We want a, sem a historic cemetery boundary dealing a nation study done, just like they've done in other cemeteries across the state of Texas. N you know, nothing new, very standard. And we're not going to bargain that with that. So we show up. And instead of two guards, there's 14 armed Alamo Rangers, and there's chains stopping us from going in. At that moment, you can think about, think about this. At that moment, our children are looking at us like going, wondering, why can't we go in? Our children are wondering, did we just screw ourselves? Are our lives no, now going to be chisqueado? Have we doomed our unborn children? Have we jinxed them? Have we cursed them? So that's what our children are thinking. Or it's going to, we had to feel these questions. Our elders, like Ray Hernandez, Ray Hernandez as a boy was being taken to this place in the 50s with his grandfather at a time where brown skins could not go and pray. There was a sign no blacks, no Mexicans, no dogs. Very simple. There was a separate water fountain there. Separate bathrooms. And Ray's, father, Ray's grandfather and Ray would have, to, would have to stand out there and have their memorial ceremony. Their way. And at that moment, Ray's in his, his mid-70s now. At that moment, our elders were thrown back to the 50s where they were prevented from going into a place by armed guards and chains. So my father was big in the civil rights too, you know, and, and there, he's 81. And so our elders who experienced the, 60, the 50s and fought for it in the 60s had to relive it once again. That just happened, man. 
That wasn't 30 years ago. That wasn't 50 years ago. That wasn't 100 years ago. Mm. That was two freaking years ago, man. You know, so when people say, you know, the American Indian story, you know, I mean, all that history, that was such a long time ago. It's happening right now. It's being made today. We're the only race of people that have to prove who we are. No other race does. Mm -hmm. You know, and so at what point does that stop? And it's only going to stop by, um, by, by this, by this fight. It's got, we got to push, we got to protect that cemetery. And, um, and, and that's, that, that, that the, the, this project has to be held accountable. I don't know if you can make a correlation, but I, I would make it, but, um, I, I'm starting to see the BDS, mo you know, movement really really take off and you start seeing younger younger um jews that are starting to critique i mean it, it sometimes history moves at a glacial speed and then all of a sudden it, it starts to pick up but you know renowned uh, scholars renowned jews have been pointing out you know apartheid uh, you know bds is all over the world um, i belong to the bds ireland ireland bds kind of group but but you start to see you know kind of slowly but changes and that's what i meant about the about the impact that somehow the people have to be mobilized the people have to know what the story is the people have to know what the you know what what you're going for and and something very very sensitive about you know people that are buried in that and the alamo um, you think that people that were deeply religious or you know um, that, that, that they have values and morals. I mean, it would just kind of get you. I mean, yeah. I kind of say that the same thing with, with Palestine. If you sure. watch what happens to it, sometimes it has to be so visceral that somebody turns around and, and they, you know, they go out there, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't know this was happening. Yeah. I didn't know that there were more than a thousand indigenous people buried in the Alamo. Um, uh, you know, these things have to be the hypocrisy. If you say, if you're focusing on state law and, and you're just looking at state law, why is the hypocrisy there? Mm -hmm. Why are they not falling? Well, they follow state law when it serves their purposes, right. but not when it serves your purposes. Right. And then, when it's convenient, and that's exactly what's going on. Yeah. Let me give you this too, so you can take it back with you. Um, talking about the youth and, and their wokeness, if you will, uh, this is what one of our youth produced uh, for the, you know. Um, Do you want to hold it up oh, just sure. for the camera? Just yeah, so that's just the, great. Yeah, for the, uh, this was a quote um, from one of the newspapers, you know, uh, in regards to the, uh, the Alamo struggle, you know, because it's our commitment to end this fight. Right. We spent $200,000 on legal fees. You know, people have mortgage homes. How, how do you guys generate funds? Uh, well, people mortgage homes. And then uh, we fundraise, you know, we you know, sell barbecue plate sales, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. we have to do, you know, things like that. You know, we, we've had GoFundMe pages, you know, we have, uh, we just started the uh, American in, uh, Indians in Texas Legal Defense Fund, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. They spent one point, if you look at their audit, we spent $200,000. On our on this on this on this fight that they Pilam had, right? Um, they, they spent one point eight million dollars on legal fees. One point eight million dollars. We show up to court. They got twenty lawyers. We have three. So, but right now, because of the new leadership, you know, at least we're in mediation now. So, see what happens. I don't know. Yeah. But. It's not, you know, we, we can't, you know, the, the cemetery has to be protected. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. how are you going to tell the story? What are you going to say? Oh, don't step there. Uh, there's no sign there, but there's people buried there. Or are you just going to ignore it like we have? You know, I think, you know, if you give people the opportunity to learn, my God, that's what makes us different from animals, is that we have the ability to learn. 
Well, you think that these things would just kind of hurt your, you know, they would hit your heartstrings out sure. there where you would just be moved by the emotion to think if this was something, you know, that, that happened to your family or loved one and you didn't, you know, about this. Let, let me tell you, I, the reality, and it's unfortunate, I've said this earlier, is that, you know, it's about actions, not words. Mm -hmm. But recognizing my pain means that you'd have to recognize your doings. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Not in a project like this, not in Texas. Yeah. Because that's what would have to happen. If you open the doors to have people question, well, what happened to them? Well, they were given land, and then the Texans, after the Battle of the Alamo, took it, stole it. You're not, you don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Right? You see, you can't do that. That's the challenge, is that they have to, they'll have to see the mirror yeah. is in front of them. Right, absolutely. You know? And, uh, you know, and, and I, it's not our fault that the Alamo is having this, is, is in the predicament that it's in now. You know, it's not our fault. We didn't create this, we didn't start this. You know, we, we will help finish it, but we didn't start this. We're not the bad and we're not the enemy in this project, right? So well, we're uh, proponents of this project. Yeah. If it's done right. Exactly, and 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 that was always kind of stressed by Ray. You know, that that we were working. You know, with them, we weren't trying to stop right. progress right. or anything else like that. There's a there's a, a very important issue at hand that we need to deal with, but we're we're happy to cooperate sure. and, and compromise. And but we we, we started early on. I have a chain of emails. Remember, I'm on this committee, mm. right, from 2014. So I'm, I'm part of the guiding process. And from that, from 2014, I have emails talking about the protection and preservation of the cemetery, making sure that we build it into the process so it doesn't hinder progress. You know, I, send, I have emails where I send them all the, all the, um, all the um, com, um, compliance uh, issues that we that we that we have to, you know, think about, mm. right? That we have, you know, Section One Hundred Six of the Federal Government, or Unified Development Codes, all these things, you know, uh, way ahead of time, so that we can be, you know, you're put, anticipating right? the future. You're well, trying to be proactive, right? Right, and all they're telling me, we'll do that when we get there. We'll get that when we get there. We'll deal with it when we get there. We'll deal with it. So all that. So now, as a result of that, they have. Two law they had lawsuits. They had the state of Texas come down on them, tell them that they can't move the cenotaph. They've spent all this money. They've had people drop out from fundraising mm -hmm. because of the lawsuits, because of the cenotaph. You know, they've had to readjust, build this building in the back that came out of nowhere. It's called the collections building now, you know. But that was off of Phil Collins, you know, because he was, he was scared. They were scared that he was going to take his stuff. I mean, it's just, it was got way out of hand. Yeah. And so we did everything. I, you know, I, I, with good conscience, I can say that I was trying to be as proactive on that committee for my colleagues and for this project to be successful. I was trying to be as proactive to, you know, as much as possible with the limited knowledge or whatever experience that I have, you know. So, oh. but, yeah. Do you have any... Um I think all of us are fading here. Oh, I yeah. could tell by the, it's been uh, uh, any um, uh, final thoughts, uh, you know, moving, uh, moving forward out, out here. I think you said something along, you want to get to a point where the, the next generation doesn't have to, to deal with the, these problems anymore. That would be a real success. No, that definitely. I mean, if we, you know, if we can get to, we have to remember that the decisions that we're making right now are how they're going to impact the future. I think what's happening right now is we're thinking about who's here right now. Mm. Who are we play? What audience are we playing to right now? One of the things that I've I been reading, there, there's so many grants which are, are about systemic racism now. It's, it's the hot topic. I actually applied for one which we didn't get and I was really kind of disappointed. I thought it was a very, very strong grant. But one of the arguments what um, was basically if we don't turn and face ourselves 
if we don't really look at systemic racism that we are are never going to heal we're never ever going to 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 move forward and and that's something that that we we need to do as as a country we have to take you know hard looks i mean uh, there, there's lots of things. I mean, I I teach my my students. I don't I don't shy away from from these things. You know, or talk about slavery at the, the you know the Alamo or what the mythology of the Alamo was or what was it really? If it was it a land grabber, but but you know that's that's totally different from mobilizing a population to question their their <coughs> you know their attitudes. And I I find um, Texas in in, in the, on that level particularly kind of unique. Uh, you know, Kwong, tenacious, well, the stuff pounded in seventh grade and, you know, the education about what actually happened at the Alamo and anybody kind of questioning that, that mythology or, you know, adding the different, I mean, it, it's clearly an up, you know, we're, yeah. when I look at the critical race theory and, and I look at the arguments for patriotic history in, in, in Texas and, and we don't want to upset white people because they, they might have guilt feelings or, you know, somebody told me there was an article. I can't remember what it was like. Like Texas, tough. Everything was like Texas tough, except when it comes to talking about slavery and racism. And they're not right. n not so tough about no, talking right. about those issues. Yeah, you know, I tell my um, look, you know, regardless of what people think, it is a very huge symbol of fight for Percy, right? This symbol is that the Alamo. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, you know, we need to break free from that. Because it was a lot more, and that's what we're trying to help, you know, in the work that we're that I that I see us doing, is breaking away from the the the, the symbolism of white supremacy, when we can focus on the rest of the Alamo, the rest of the history, and talk about the interconnectedness of a people, of a place. Right, I tell my you know, I heard something. Uh, in a, in, a, in a conference some years back, and it stuck with me, and, and I share this with uh, with uh, with uh, with with our people here. Is like, you know, we can never be in unity with whiteness, because whiteness doesn't want us. We can be in unity with white people, but we can't be in unity with whiteness. And I think that that's what we're trying to change here with this Alamo too. We have an opportunity to lead this country in a way that no other city had, can, could do. You know, with the, with you know, with I, I just think that we we have the, we have the greatest American story around perseverance here that we can share with the world. And we're giving in. Mm -hmm. We're buckling to all you know to 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 you know this 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 um this antiquated you know uh ways of thinking you know that um like we're this fear we're giving into this fear that's just plaguing you know this whole country hmm. you know that they're, that they're they have to defend they're the defenders of something now hmm. you know and um I, I just I, that's the opportunity that we have is we to change that. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank John. you. Yeah. Thank you.